you're a little if you're a little squeamish of insects, hang in there. It's all right. You're going to see a lot of different types, and I'm just going to show you these beautiful creatures and and explain why they're so beneficial, why we need them. Okay, and I'm going to cut off my video, and hopefully everyone can see the screen okay, and I'm going to start my share. So the title of our workshop today is More Than Monarchs, The Ecological Significance of Milkweed. Because like I said, so many people just, you know, don't realize that, oh, okay, we should be worried about this plant. We should care about whether or not this plant is, is um, here for generations to come. But, you know, I think, I think because we put so much focus on just one of the beneficial insects, we really don't take time to think about all of the beneficial insects, the entire picture. Miss, Miss Sonia? Yes? We can only see your gorgeous photo. For some reason, we lost your screen share. No. Yes. Okay. <laughs> We're going to figure this out. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. So, so when you screen share, don't forget the two optimizes. All right. So sorry. No, it's okay. We're gonna get it. <laughs> I am. Do, do they have the screen? share screen? Um, okay. Do we see that? Right. We see your screen. Yes, and we see your slide deck, and then um. So you just want to do your share there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> now I'm, I'm like, oh no. Okay. Optimize. Yes. All right. I think we're good. Can you see it? Yes. There's a little, awesome. mm -hmm. there's a little box. I don't know what that is, but all right. We'll, we'll, we'll come back out again. <laughs> there's a, yeah, I don't know what that little box is, but we can see your slides fine. Okay, I'm gonna just try one more time. How are we? Are we? We're see you. Okay. Right. Green chair. So sorry, everyone. Okay, these things happen. <laughs> it's amazing that we can, because you're all the way in New Jersey, it's amazing that we can use technology to bring you in at all to learn from you. So yeah, I will. Very true. Very true. Now, all right, let me, let me just make sure your co-host, sure we don't have that issue. Yeah. Okay, good. That's good. All right. So let's go try the screen share again. Maybe at the top, do you see where it says security warning? Maybe do enable content. Okay. And I don't know why that little box is there, but really it's just at the bottom. And so um, I don't think it's, a, yeah, I don't know why that I've never seen that. I don't see a little box. No, oh, yes. <laughs> I think it's it's actually pretty minor. So, all right. That's yes. the top. Oh, okay. I, don't know why I see what that is. That's that bar. You know your control bar oh. that's usually there. Um, that's what that is, and it's showing up. But that's okay. We can okay. go past that. Okay. All right. So yeah. let's just start fresh again. <laughs> so everyone, um, we're going to talk about the importance of monarch butterflies and, or the importance of milkweed and how it goes beyond just regular monarch butterflies. And let's see if we can get this moving. All right, okay. So this is me, I'm Sonia Harris. I am a retired school teacher. I taught for 25 years in the educational system. I taught special education. And I became passionate about gardening as a teacher because I used it to teach my students 
outside of the box. Um, I re retired from teaching in 2019 because I started a nonprofit called the Bullock Garden Project. And what this organization does is we help people grow food gardens and we teach, we do all of this, these wonderful things uh, to make sure that people have access to healthy, fresh food. And when I retired, I became a master gardener through Rutgers University, which is pretty much, um, you get one semester and it is an intensive biology, um, botany, horticulture, and landscaping class all rolled into one. And since then, I've also become a seed farmer and I love doing it. I can grow beautiful things here in my garden and on my farm for just to get them to go all the way to seed. Now today I have a little co-host and she's not popping up. <laughs> um, you may hear a little bit from my noisy girl. It's my dog and for some reason, some things aren't popping. There she is. That's Pomona Sprout. She's just laying here with me, but if she hears her dog friends outside, you're definitely gonna hear from her. So I'm gonna apologize in advance for the barking. So before we get started, you're going to not only hear, but you're going to see um, different names of the, the uh, milkweed. All of it has you know, some specific names, just like we all have names. And plants are classified in this botanical nomenclature, which is Latin, and they're classified by genus and species. And the best way I can explain that is that the genus is the family. That's their big group. And they get put into a genus by, you know, what is their, what are their qualities? Now, milkweed is all in the Asclepius family. So you see some of the different names here of the different Asclepius. Um, like right here, we have Asclepius speciosa. We have Asclepius subulata. And we have Asclepius, oh my, with me saying that name, Curasovica. <laughs> it's all Latin, so I'm not gonna do it perfectly. But they all have that same family that they're in, Asclepius, and then they're different species or their group within that family. And what makes them family are their, like I said before, is their flower shape, but also they have the same type of seed pod. It's not exactly the same, but it's very close. And you will get to see different types of milkweed as we go through this. Um, please know that there are hundreds of different types of milkweed. And all of these are important to our environment. And you know, please make sure if whatever milkweed is native in your area, that you are uh, taking care of it, growing it, and making sure that others uh, cherish it. So what is milkweed? Milkweed is a native plant that we have here in North America. And it is so important for all sorts of insects, beetles, birds. It's just important for all of these beautiful creatures. Um, it is the keystone to supporting these diverse insects, birds, and mammals. And right here, what you'll see is the hummingbird moth. And it is on this beautiful, beautiful uh, milkweed plant over here, which is Asclepius speciosa or showy milkweed. And I'm going to try and move this bar around <laughs> certain times where there is uh, some, where there's something that you can uh, read because I want to make sure that you do at least see the name. Um, and I know if you're watching the recording later, I want to make sure that you also can access what the name of the plants are and maybe what the name of the wildlife is that is using it. Why is milkweed so important to us? Milkweed is such an important plant. For many years, people called it milkweed because if you break it open, it does have a milky substance that's in uh, the stem and in uh, all of the uh, all of the uh, 
the stem, the leaves, when you break them off also, the leaves have this milky substance that's in them. Now the milky substance is toxic to certain animals. It's definitely toxic if some uh, mammals eat it. For humans, if we get the milk on our skin, uh, normally we're told to wash it off as soon as possible because it can cause a rash, but it will hurt you really bad if you eat it, if we eat it. Um, so it's not meant for us. And because of this, farmers long time ago, centuries ago, started eradicating this beautiful plant from fields because they said their cows would eat it and the cows would get really sick or the cows would die. Also, milkweed is, because it's a native plant, it is a spreader. It will run roots and spread all over. It's just amazing to watch it grow. So you can plant seeds in one spot, but because it has um, a, a very voracious way of growing, those roots can spread and pop up little babies off of it and, and really just run rampant. So because of that, they felt it was an invasive plant and they started killing this plant pulling it up and unfortunately devising all different types of chemicals to help eradicate it. They want it to get rid of the milkweed plant. Now we know that if we get rid of any type of plant, it's going to affect our biodiversity. Native plants are native for a reason. They are able to withstand our winters, our summers. They're able to have a symbiotic relationship with insects, with mammals, with all sorts of our native wildlife. So if we get rid of the milkweed, we're also harming all of these other aspects in our ecosystem. If we get rid of these insects, um, these mammals, these different things, we're also going to affect our food. People forget that we need pollinators in order for us to eat. So if you don't have this diversity, then you also don't have food. You don't have clothes. You don't have the essentials that we need to live. And here, this is a little European bumblebee or European uh, honeybee on Asclepius tuberosa or butterfly milkweed. Now we have to definitely hit on monarchs and milkweed. Why is this so important? So we know that milkweed is synonymous with the monarch butterfly. These are such beautiful butterflies and they only, only lay their eggs on the milkweed plant. In this top picture, we have mama monarch laying her egg on a variety of milkweed. Here's how tiny that egg is. And you can see it is just so, so minuscule. That little egg, you'll miss it most times if you're looking for them. Sometimes you'll gloss right over it because they are so tiny. And here it is blown up a little more. But milkweed is so important to the monarch because it is the only plant that they will lie, lay their eggs on. And as their caterpillars hatch, they rely on milkweed as their only food source. Now think of that, their only food source. Even though you'll see monarchs flitter from flower to flower, collecting pollen, eating nectar, doing all of those wonderful things, it really relies, the caterpillar relies on milkweed for food. And if we don't have that, yes, we are going to watch, unfortunately, the monarch butterfly go extinct. There's a push right now to put the monarch on uh, the at-risk list, the endangered list. And I really hope they do because we need to we need to save this beautiful creature right here. But let's get into some of the other insects that love milkweed. This is the Eastern bumblebee. This is my, I live in New Jersey. This is my native bumblebee right here. And one of my favorite insects. The bumblebee is over here just flitting around on the uh, Asclepius tuberosa, just having a great time. And if you look at this other picture over here, this is from my garden. This is a little bumblebee in the heat of that we had this past summer here in New Jersey. There were many days, many, many days where it was well over 100 degrees. And 
this common milkweed plant that's right here is under a peach tree. And these little bumblebees really enjoy taking naps on the leaves, just in the shade. So it's so adorable. I had to put that picture in here. But bees, native species, and honeybees are attracted to the nectar that's in the milkweed. Now, it's a mutual relationship because it benefits both the bees and the milkweed. The bees are going to help cross-pollinate all of the milkweed, and it's going to support its reproduction. We want that to happen. We want to be able to keep uh, milkweed in production, and the bees need it. The bees need to eat. The bees need to be able to feed their babies. And also, we need to keep the milkweed in production. We need it to, to always be flowering. Our next insect is a beetle. I absolutely love this beetle. This is the large milkweed beetle. This right here is the adult. The first picture is the adult milkweed beetle. I know you may see these and think, oh, it's disgusting and try to kill it or flush it or whatever, because you just might think, oh, it's just a disgusting bug. But the relationship that this insect has with milkweed is absolutely amazing. First of all, we have this beautiful orange and white and black insect. Now I want you to think of these colors, orange, white, and black. This is, a, is an insect that relies on milkweed, just like the monarch butterfly, who is also orange, white, and black. The life cycle of this milkweed beetle really revolves around its reliance on, um, on milkweed. Now the adults will emerge late spring, early summer, and you really get to see these a lot through the entire summer and sometimes into early fall. But it coincides perfectly with the flowering of milkweed plants. They'll feed on the nectar and they help contribute to pollination. But this right here is large milkweed beetle larva. This is a baby. And the larva will come out and it likes to eat on the milkweed leaves. But if you see here in the last picture, these are all of the babies and that's a seed pod. That is a seed pod. What they will do, they will eat on that tender flesh of that seed pod. And believe it or not, they don't hurt the seeds at all. And you'll get to see the seeds later on. So they'll eat this covering off of the seed pod. And what do you think happens then with the seeds when they're free? they're going to scatter in the wind. So this is nature's way of making sure the milkweed continues reproducing because this beetle, this baby, will get in here and they make sure that those seeds are free to scatter by the wind. So if you see them on your milkweed, don't get afraid, they're not gonna hurt it. They're actually doing amazing work with mother nature to make sure the milkweed can continue. Next, let's get into the tussock moth. Now, this is my absolute favorite behind, behind monarchs. And sometimes I really worry that they're in competition here with the monarch butterfly as my favorite. This is a beautiful moth that has this amazing relationship with milkweed and with the monarch. As you can see, just like the large milkweed beetle, just like with the monarch, the colors on this this caterpillar are orange, white, and black. We also see this in the adult tussock moth. It has the same type of coloring as the monarch butterfly. And I just think that's fascinating that these, these insects that all rely on, on milkweed all have the same type of coloring. Now what makes this insect so amazing is that it hatches, it puts its eggs also on the milkweed or nearby. And what the tussock moth caterpillar does, now you see it looks hairy. I, I always say it looks like little bits of yarn or a yarn project someone forgot to finish. But this will eat the leaves that are too big and too like heavy for the, milk, for the caterpillar of the monarch butterfly. So the, the caterpillars of the monarchs 
really like the tender leaves. It's easier for them to chew. It's easier for them to process. But milkweed plants can get really big. Um, some of them, I'm 5'5", five five, and some plants were taller than me, about my height or even taller. And that's with the common milkweed species. And these leaves can get really big. So when they get really big, they're not as tender, they're not as flavorful as the young ones. So the monarch caterpillars won't eat them. The tussock moth caterpillar will. It will devour them. As you can see on the second picture, I know it creeps a lot of people out, but they're so cute. <laughs> so they're in here and they will eat all of the leaves, but they also have another amazing feature that I'm gonna show you really quick. Hopefully you can hear the videos. Um, Deb, if you can just let me know if no one can hear them, it's okay. We don't have to play them. Um, what I'll do is make sure that you have these links and they can be attached with the YouTube video. So I'm gonna start on um, playing them. They're very short, they're from my own TikTok and I'm gonna talk more about the tussock moth caterpillar. The little tussock moth, caterpillar. Little tussock moth yarn caterpillar is over here looking like a yarn project someone didn't finish, but it emits cardiac glycoside, which protects the monarch caterpillars. Tells the bats, don't eat us or we'll kill you. And it eats all the milkweed. Interrelationships. I wanted so many Hi everyone, it's Sonia, your NJ Garden teacher, and I am coming back to talk to you again this year about the adorable little tussock moth caterpillar. Aren't they so cute? Here's a milkweed plant that's about my height. I'm 5'5", and here are the tussock caterpillars. Now what these do is they will feed on the milkweed plant, but they also send out this uh, aroma that lets bats know that they are there on the plant. During the evening, bats will fly and sometimes will eat the monarch caterpillars if they are in the open. But with the presence of the tussock moth caterpillar, it sends out a signal that says, don't eat us because you don't want the smoke. I, I mean, it looks like it will do some damage, but it will kill a bat. But what it does, it will cut off the milk supply in the milkweed, tells the milkweed it's time to die, and then it will feed on the leaves after the monarch caterpillar feeds on the leaves. I think it's amazing. Nature is just incredible. So you can see why I really love this little insect so much. The relationship that it has with milkweed and the monarch is unlike any other relationship that we see. And, you know, it, it helps to naturally regulate how the milkweed produces. Is it time for it to start growing? And as you saw in that second video, it really decimates the plant. And it does. It takes off every single leaf. It will take it down to just pretty much the skeleton of the plant. And it makes it very easy for me, the human who is helping to facilitate this relationship, to then pull it, move it out the way, and let another milkweed plant grow. Because usually there's milkweed all growing close together. And if I move this out the way, it gives the other milkweed a chance to become a host plant again. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about birds, birds and milkweed. Now, at the beginning, I showed you the hummingbird moth on the showy milkweed. But here we have an actual hummingbird, the Rufus hummingbird on the same Asclepius species, which is um, showy milkweed. And that is no coincidence. This plant is native. Sorry, there's my <laughs> Mama. This plant is native to, to the Midwest and the West Coast. And that's where both of those specific um, species of insect and bird are native. And this milkweed is also native to that area. So they really um, all thrive off of this plant. 
But one thing I love about milkweed with um, birds is that it also can provide hiding places for the birds. We know that hummingbirds are so tiny. And if you look at this Rufius hummingbird in relation, oh, well, in relation to the showy milkweed, you can see it's really not big at all. But this milkweed plant will provide uh, a place for the hummingbird or other birds to take shelter. It really makes, um, it really provides, you know, th this cover to these small birds that could be prey to larger birds. Uh, during the summer, we get to see a lot of goldfinch and goldfinch will not only hang out in the milkweed plants, hide in the milkweed plants because I also have owls and hawks and eagles and those big birds will, will um, hunt those small colorful birds. And by hiding in the milkweed, these, these amazing birds are able to escape becoming dinner. But here's another beautiful thing that birds do. Now, before I told you about the milkweed pods, now this right here is a dried milkweed pod. Whether or not the milkweed beetles eat the first layer, the, the uh, green layer off of the pod, it will end up like this, it will dry. It has many layers to it, so it will dry. And when they eat that top layer off, it just reaches this point quicker. So it'll dry faster. And inside these brown things are the actual milkweed seed. And then they have these beautiful silks. And the silk is what usually carries the milkweed on the wind. But what birds will do, birds will come in and especially goldfinches, like I said here that we have in Jersey, the Eastern goldfinch or just many other types of goldfinch will use these silks in their nests. So the birds will come in, grab these silks. And of course, if the birds are grabbing the silks, what's happening to that seed? Well, that seed is going to get dispersed. It's they, The birds don't really want this seed. So they will pick it off and throw it wherever it lands. And this is how you get new milkweed by those seeds being on the ground. So we also need this plant because the birds need it for their nests so they can continue reproducing beautiful birds. And so the milkweed can also continue. But of course, I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the importance of monarchs. We have to go back to the monarch butterfly. Now these are all from my yard, my little monarch baby next to the Asclepius tuberosa. This is monarch caterpillar on um, some common milkweed and in the final picture, we have a monarch chrysalis. We need these important creatures to continue because we need to have food. We need to make sure that we are stewards of the earth. And once we get rid of the monarch caterpillar or the monarch butterfly, our earth is going to decline at an even faster pace. Monarchs are so important because they love pollinating. They love flitting from flower to flower. And when they do that, they not only pollinate gorgeous you know, uh, flowers that we love to see, they're also pollinating our food, tomatoes, cucumbers, corn. All of these things have flowers before they grow fruit. And monarchs will go to all of those flowers so it can feed from the nectar. Then it needs a place where it can safely reproduce for its caterpillars, for its young. And the only plant, the only plant that does that is the milkweed. And remember, like I said earlier on, milkweed is in this largest family called Asclepius. It doesn't matter the variety or the species of the milkweed. It just needs plants from the Asclepius family that are all milkweed. So once we get rid of the milkweed plant, we say it's too much. We say that it's a rapid spreader. We say that, oh, it's competing with my other plants in my garden. And you wanna pull it out. What you're actually doing is helping to, helping to make this monarch butterfly reach extinction much faster. This is why we all really have to take into account the importance of the milkweed butterfly 
or I'm sorry, the positive monarch butterfly and why we need this beautiful creature to be around. We need food, we need our planet, and we need a balanced ecosystem. Thank you so much for taking part in this today. So sorry about all of the technical issues. That has been my, my curse this year with the MBTIs. I'm having all the technical difficulties here. But if you'd like to reach out and learn more, our website is bullockgardenproject.org. We do have some free webinars there, some free videos there, um, and you can watch those and learn more. But I am also across social media as NJ Garden Teacher, and I post videos that are just about my garden and my farm and try to teach others about that you know, in general and how to grow food as well. Uh, I really am so thankful for you for coming to this today, for being a part. And um, again, I'm so sorry about all the technical difficulties, but I'd love to take time and answer some questions for you right now. All right, so um, we had one question, like specifically since um, we're based in Illinois. Um, okay. so recently, they're trying to develop projects called greenways, which is basically putting like plants or like like near the highways and everything, you know, to increase our biodiversity and get more involved with our environment. Um, we're right. wondering, like, what is your opinion on that? Because there has been, um, they're kind of hinting on like the mortality rates of the plants and like how that. Yeah. Works. Yeah. So, what are what are your opinions on that? Oh my goodness, it's a mix. <laughs> it's a definite mix. Now, I um, I get to travel out to the Midwest a lot, and um, I see this a lot also in Michigan. So um, there, there are all of these beautiful, beautiful native plant areas on highways that are filled with milkweed. And I think that, yes, it's beautiful. It's wonderful. I love that they're doing this. But to see butterflies hit the windshield of a car is also a little frightening. <laughs> it's a little frightening. Um, I'd rather see milkweed growing than not growing because like I said, this is a place where the monarch butterfly can actually lay its egg. And hopefully the caterpillar, once it turns into a butterfly, will flit away from that area. And I think it's better to have it than to not. But, you know, let's just, I think that just goes into the importance of why it's even more important for us as the general public to grow the, these beautiful plants wherever we are. Just make sure that we are growing them in our own homes or at our homes, in our yards, at our schools, at our libraries, everywhere. So we don't have to rely on the Department of Transportation to put these plants in a place that is just going to make them more at risk. And that showy milkweed is a native to the Midwest. So I hope all of you go get some showy milkweed and, uh, grow for the hummingbird moths, the hummingbirds, and for the monarchs. So we actually got another question, and this reads, if we only have a very small space in our yard to plant milkweed, does that make a difference? Like, just the air- Oh, it's great. It's great. Milkweed does not really have to have a lot of space, depending on the type of plant. Now, the one with the little orange flowers, the Asclepius tuberosa, that for me is grown very low to the ground. And I think some of these, you can really look and see what is native in your area. I have grown some milkweed that is native to the Midwest and to the West Coast. It doesn't do as well because it's not my native. It needs maybe uh, some different types of insects, different types of weather. But with my native plants, I have Asclepius tuberosa, which grows low to the ground, and then common milkweed or Asclepius uh, syrica, which grows really tall. And I mean, they're long and lean. It's maybe one or two plants that will just grow straight up. The flowers maybe get about this big. There's like a big pom-pom at the top. So you have this big pom-pom ball and everything will be trying to pollinate around this one flower ball. Um, it's amazing. So you don't have to have a lot of space to do it. Just even if you have one pot and you can put that pot outside or of your step, of your apartment, wherever, on a balcony, you'll still attract um, monarchs. 
Um, and then we have an additional question from the chat. And then they asked, what alternate plants would you plant along the highways? Like going back to that. Uh, I plant a lot of other native species, depending on where you are. Um, what I've seen in my work in Michigan, I do some work with the Ann Arbor Farm and Garden Club out there. So um, that's one of their pet projects. And I really recommend planting a lot of like goldenrod. And there are a lot of different types of shrubs that have beautiful flowers and um, can be host to pollinators. So um, you have service berry, you have, um, you know, like I said, all different types of common native plants wherever you are. Um, bachelor's button, daisies, you name, you name the plant, you're going to find them out there. Um, echinacea or uh, I'm trying to remember the common name for it right now. And that's out of my head, but Echinacea purpura is one of those, those classics. That's a North American native that we recommend to plant in all of these places. Now, it doesn't mean that insects are not going to end up on a windshield. It happens, but that can happen when you're driving anywhere. Um, I still think, like I said, I think it's good to still plant milkweed even in these highway areas because we want the monarch to have places to lay the eggs. But anywhere where you can plant native plants, so your native insects and birds and mammals, can access them, I think it's is wonderful. There she goes. <laughs> All right, we got another question and it says, when we collect the seeds in the fall, do we have to store them in the freezer over the winter or can we just leave them out or how would that work? Okay, so um, what I do, because milkweed seeds, at least, Kavona, sorry y'all. <laughs> Pomona, her friends are out, she knows it so she can hear them. Um, what milkweed, at least here on the East Coast, um, because we're a temperate climate, you know, we get all four seasons. Milkweed, our milkweed needs to have cold stratification. It needs to have cold weather to signal for it, like, okay, it's time for you to start growing. So what I do when I collect seeds, I will keep the seeds in my refrigerator. And then around January, so I already have some that are in soil. And I just have the dried seeds in an envelope in the refrigerator um, in, a, in a box. And then what I did in January, I took them out, I put soil into baggies, and then I made soil moist and I put the seeds in there, put it back into the refrigerator and it actually started uh, to root. It's starting to grow. What you can do if you don't want to do that, I mean, sometimes your parents, I know would be like, don't do not put soil in my refrigerator. <laughs> don't put a bag of dirt in my fridge. You can actually start these outside in the winter. Um, but like I said, make sure that it's, it's a milkweed that needs to have the cold weather. If you live on the West coast or the Southwest, your milkweed is not going to need that. So you can stick them out. What a lot of people do is they put them in milk jugs. So they cut open milk jugs put soil in it, take the top back on it, and then put them outside. Um, but I don't use milk jugs as because it's a, a plastic. Um, I have done this with cartons because I use oat milk. So I use oat milk cartons. I've done that and put them outside in the winter so they can have the snow, they can have the cold weather because that signals for them to grow. So you can do this, collect them in the fall. You're going to have a better result if you plant them or keep them somewhere cold plant them in the winter or keep them somewhere cold and let them go in the spring and summer. All right. So um, just our last question to kind of wrap everything up. Um, we were just wondering like, what are your future goals or like projects that you see that like you want to develop or happen and like, how can um, we support that as well? Oh, that's so sweet. So what I do, um, I really promote gardening with everyone. And it doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter if you're an apartment or you have a home that has land. Everyone needs to be growing plants, growing food, not only for you, for your family, uh, saving that seed so you don't have to purchase it again. And sometimes it takes some getting used to, because like for me, I don't, there's certain foods I don't eat year round, like tomatoes. I will not eat a tomato year round. I only eat it if it's, if it's grown fresh, grown local. And um, usually because I'm growing it myself, but I will not buy it from the grocery store because it's out of season. Um, 
I want to make sure that other people are learning to do this as well. We have to start taking our role in the environment seriously. Our role. Humans have destroyed it. And only humans are going to be able to help repair it. So by planting plants, planting food, taking that responsibility on, you're actually helping push forward uh, what the Lock Garden Project and what I, Sonia Harris, stand for, and that's being stewards of the earth. Um, you know, we do a lot with uh, just, like I said, with teaching people in general the importance of this. So, I mean, you help us by liking our social media, by spreading <laughs> the word, um, by understanding that Pomona's friends are outside and she wants to be there. <laughs> but, and, you know, just by just by making sure that everyone takes responsibility for this environment. I keep saying that, you know, I'm a Gen X person. I know that my generation and generations before us have done damage. And I really believe that it's this generation of youth that are going to bring the solutions, that are going to make the difference, that are going to make the change. So please, if you have your ideas, don't be afraid to tell the old people like me what needs to happen. Stand up on your soapbox, make your voice heard, and really get out there and scream for the environment, for the climate, because if you don't, it's not going to go in a great place. And if anyone out there ever needs seeds, wants to start gardening, doesn't know where to start, you can contact us and we will help you at no cost. All right. Well, that seems about it. And I just want to thank you for this wonderful presentation. You did great. Thank you. Did <laughs> thank you. And um, so next up, we have Rhinos with Martha. And just, of course, again, just thank you guys for showing up and thank Sonia Harris for this wonderful presentation. And this is about wraps up the first presentation of the MBTI. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye, Andrew. Thank you.